we can uh, expect in general practice is they've said probably a two-year time scale uh, for the developments to come into the lower risk areas like general practice. So I think we're probably looking at maybe April 2015 as being the area where we get some details of what will be a new inspection and, uh, and regulation process from CQC. They will be keeping the 28 regulations as we've seen in the uh, essential standards of quality and safety. However, they're going to move more from looking at the, uh, each of the regulations individually, and they're going to move to looking at what they call their five key questions. I don't think everybody in the NHS goes to work with the intention of providing services that meet those standards. However, we have found from some of the things that have gone wrong that it doesn't always translate itself into direct care for patients. And my big dilemma when I'm thinking about patients' access to GP services is about, is it based upon what patients need or what patients want? And at the moment, of course, I think we're rather confused about that. Well, we're not confused and the patients aren't confused, it's just that we're working on one thing and they're working on something. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the outcomes, 18, 19 and 20, you know if you read in the guidebook, are about uh, notifications to, uh, to CQC. And they have actually produced some guidance for uh, general practices. This came out in May of this year. Anybody here taken a look at this? No? It's uh, statutory notifications, uh, guidance for registered providers and managers of uh, NHS GP and other primary medical services. Outbreaks of infection are not notifiable to CQC, they're notifiable to Public Health England. However, because of course cleanliness, infection control is one of the outcomes under CQC, Public Health England may liaise with CQC over that, but the notification doesn't go to them. In Bristol they realise that this acute trust emphasis yes. with the appointment of the hospital inspectors yeah. was their really, really yes. quick priority. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm reassured to see that they were already talking about safe, effective, well led. Yeah. Those principles were what yes. they wanted to just test and adjust. Mm -hmm. But they sounded pretty reasonable to me. Uh -huh. You don't have any responsibilities for notification in the you know the uh, whole uh, outcome in the um, in the book about this about absence of a patient who's been detained under the Mental Health Act. You have no responsibilities for this if you are purely a primary care uh, provider. They were very clear in, co in coming and saying that if we could demonstrate um, robust, workable policies and procedures, and they could see that in practice through talking to staff and patients, then that is, is compliance. Uh, you don't have to ask for a brand spanking new symptom. And I, I was panicking, I did try to encourage my GPs to spend money on new symptoms and new symptoms. And my GP said, no, if they have a problem with it, then they can give us a notice and they can come back in 28 days and then we'll deal with it. But wait until we're put, then let's not go overboarding. So they were right on that. I went on the internet and I looked at local postcodes, who, local postcodes, who had had a recent inspection. And I found the dental practice that I'd done six weeks earlier. And I phoned up this really nice dentist and I said, we've got a CQC inspection. We're first in this area. Have you got any tips? He said, you want me to come and go? And this guy came out and spent about three or four hours with me. And he said, this would be an idea, that would be an idea, this would be an idea, this is what we would do like that. So I found that really, really useful, being able to network and get some information from somebody local. And then very cleverly what they were doing is they were leaving after talking to me. They were then going downstairs and talking to the staff. So obviously they were checking what I'd said to them and then asking the staff. And they were also very cleverly rewording some of their questions to the staff. To, to find out if, if they had an understanding. I found that the inspection was very, very much um, focused on, not paper, surprisingly, but talking to staff and patients. Very little time on paper and policies, almost, I would say, 10% <coughs> on paper, 90% on talking to people and getting views and opinions. Pick up on that with a member of staff or then go back to something and say, right, could I just see your results on this, to, to, just to make sure what you were saying, and you hadn't forgot what you said at the beginning, he was, he was very clever. Um, but they, they basically watched patients into the waiting room um, at the beginning, observed the reception, didn't talk to, speak to them, looked through, and what I consider to be really important from your internal pra practice processes 
is that you have something in people's statement of terms and conditions or employment conditions somewhere that says that if any member of staff does anything that might bring their continued employment or their suitability to do their job into question, they must disclose it to you. We've kept it that way and we've been to like a dozen toolkits, I suppose, that we need to study it better and study it. But instead of every single, we started off with the training pack, we saw and everything, and it's just it's ridiculous. So many precise bits. We just had a, a, a thing at the back that they signed and they've done it. And then when we've reviewed, like when we've reviewed a policy, bought a new policy, I'll be put it in there. So we just sort of have one sheet just with the names on it.